Okay, so hello, um, I'm Tommy. Uh, basically, just one thing to say, just feel comfortable, right? This is not a conference. Okay, just, this, this, is, this is me being a musician just like everybody else, so we love music. We're here to talk. Okay, we have a lovely man here who's going to explain us a few things about social media, about business models. But this is an informal discussion yeah. organized a little bit formally, all right? So that's it. Just feel free to ask any questions. We're not going to have a mic, all right? So whenever you, you, you have a serious question to ask, just talk a little bit louder, all right? So we can grab the camera and later you can have the video really nicely edited and everything. Um, so what this is all about, for the ones that have not been here before, and I've seen like around 20 people, 15 people that I knew. So basically this is a series of discussions where uh, they're happening every month here in the same place, uh, thanks to our sponsors, um, um, London uh, Fusion. So basically, what we try, what my vision is, is to have free music education for all musicians for topics outside the music spectrum. Okay, so no playing an instrument and stuff like psychology, like social media, like marketing, like design. Okay, so this is my vision. I want this thing to happen all over the world. So now we're here in London. Maybe there's going to be another country in the near future. So just enjoy the whole thing. Um, you are the, the, the blood of the whole thing. Okay, so without your participation, this thing is just uh, another conference. All right, which doesn't make any sense. Um, so, so yeah, um, nothing else to say. I don't want to be talking because we have an interesting discussion to start. Um, so Simon uh, is a very experienced social media trainer for his company Social B. And today, for the ones that don't know the topic, is uh, social uh, business models and music. So that's it. Uh, please, at the end, if you have any rubbish, just collect it. That's it. You can tweet, you can take pictures, yeah. you can do whatever you want. <laughs> We're not a cinema here, so... Enjoy, um, uh, Andre. Okay. Um, so yeah. Cool. Let's get started. Hey, good evening, everybody, good evening. and welcome. It's great, great to see you all. Um, as as someone involved in social media, it shouldn't surprise you that if you put your name in, probably about four o'clock today, I probably checked you out. So I know some some bits about your music, where you're coming from, and we've got a real cross section here tonight. Everyone from from DJs, producers, sound engineers, through to, to, to rappers, through to uh, singers, through to, to guitarists, and everything, everyone in between. So actually, this, this network could prove invaluable for you in terms of your career, in making connections. Hopefully, you're doing that already. Um, a bit, a bit about me. Um, I'm a, a partner in Social B. I love doing training. Um, I'm also a musician. I'll come on to that in, in, in a bit. But I'll explain to some, somebody outside that... Um, uh, one of the buzzes I get, which is a bit like being on stage, is actually training people with social media. There's some kind of connection with an audience, and you see someone you're talking about Twitter, and they go, ah. And it's almost like them singing, singing your words back, back to you. Um, I don't know how to describe it. That's the only way I can describe it. Maybe I'm just weird. I suppose I am. Um, a bit about me, though, in terms of music. Uh, this is me here. This is, this is Camden Palais. So I'm not sure it exists anymore. There's something there. There's, a, there's a, um, a nightclub there or something. This is 1987. Let me talk to you about 1987. 1987, four channels in the UK for TV. This is the final, the final of TSB Rock School. TSB, a bank that used to exist now coming back. My band here along the lines had got through to the TSB Rock School final. We'd got through from the regional finals. We'd won the regional finals down in South Wales and got through to London. The time said these guys on here were going to win because at the time we, we were current. There was a, a Motown um, revival going on and we, as you can see, we have brass and we were doing our Motown thing. We had some great vocalists and what have you. And this would be one of the, the routes into music, um, getting noticed, someone seeing you. Winning this competition meant you, you would have a load of cash to go and spend on new uh, equipment. But you actually go into a recording studio, record something. 
And for those of you who weren't around in 1987, um, recording was on vinyl or cassette, would take a long time and was very expensive. The other side of this as well, it was actually national TV. So think of Saturday morning TV in the UK when there's only four channels on. This, this was high profile. And what happened? This band that were tipped to, to win, hands down, two things happened. The first is a, a band from Northern Ireland cleverly realised TSB was sponsoring this big events and thought, ooh, Caravan of Love was in the charts at the time. You know, join the caravan of love, stand up. Sorry about my singing. And change the lyrics to um, join, the join the trusty savings bank. Say yes, say yes. So a really smart move in sort of terms of business and music. The, the other one, which is probably more important and probably why we lost it, was our lead singer dropped the F-bomb during a song, which you do not do in 1987, when you have got TV recording you for, for, for BBC, you have an audience of school kids and their teachers. And uh, as you can tell, I'm teaching social media, not on a stage somewhere. And it could have, could have been so different. Having said that, my, my music career has, has ambled along. I can, my, one of my claims to fame is I've actually toured um, with a number one recording artist, which everyone's going, really? Yeah, when I explain, it's R Ricky Valance. You probably think, Ricky who? Ricky Valance in 1959 had a hit with Tell Laura I Love Her, which some of you will know. <laughs> and a friend of mine, probably about some 10, 10 12 years ago, said, can you, can you turn up and play bass for this guy? Um, he's looking for a bassist. So that's, that's my claim to fame. Um, but I have been involved in music, still play bass, still play guitar, still songwrite. So the traditional business model was something that we'd, we'd experienced. We'd experienced huge failure. And I just want to explore that before we go into social. So anyone own one of these things and put all your kit in the back of it? So pe people like Oasis, you know, say, for Transit in the 1990s was one of the things that got them this huge success. Travelling with the band from venue to venue, hoping they would get noticed, hoping someone from a record label would be there to see them. Um, some of my um, friends were in a uh, synth, synth band, um, had, a, had a recording deal, um, were dropped from the label. I remember them um, turning up at a gig, uh, had probably about sort of two, two, three hundred people there um, for a small band, which was great. The, um, the guy from the next record label didn't turn up. And one of their best gigs turned into be uh, one of the biggest downers for them because they knew, okay, we've got 300 people here, everyone's going for it, but actually this, this is the end of our music um, journey. So you record, you, you travel, you play live, you, you do your stuff. And then hopefully you get more people turning up than the one person here. That person could be a record executive and sign you. This is the old model, remember. And these guys have also been waiting a long time for their chance to make it big. Then what would happen? You'd um, push out your, your, your LP, your singles, and you see how, how, how it would, would hit the market. What sort of take-up would be there? Would there be spin-offs? Could you um, go on TV on top of the pops and other things as well? One thing to notice here is, um, I remember this very well, some of you this might be quite alien to, but just how stacked the music is in this shop, and I'll come on to that in a minute. And one of my favourite horns in my student days, Virgin Megastore, as, as was Tower Records, these huge cathedrals to um, the music of its day, um, including the rare imports that I couldn't find anywhere else. And having said that, Virgin Megastore, um, as huge as it was, as vast as it was, had a finite shelf space. So the music it stocked was based on could it, could it resell it, could it make a profit, and actually how many shells were there. And in terms of the music industry at this time, I was thinking in, in, in terms of things I see on people's CV. I use LinkedIn a lot, which is a social media network, and see what people have been doing. And I was thinking about some of the, the words I'd um, describe, some of the entries I see on there. First, you've got what I'd call the lifers. So those, those people in the music industry that always seem to have been there, always doing stuff. So, you know, the first one's Bono. Any recognize the second one? Any calls? Sorry, up there. Too dark? 
Suzanne Vega, you remember Suzanne Vega? She's still going, she's still going. She still has had a very successful career. The, the 80s, late 80s were really big for her, but she's still recording, still touring. What about, hey, this is a real test, what about this guy on the end here? If, if you're a guitarist and you don't know this guy, check him out. Bruce Coburn, Canada's Finest. First album in 1969, has been producing albums ever since. Toured the UK last year, coming back to London very soon. And still going. I can't, can't think how old he is, but um, I got the privilege of meeting, meeting him last year, and he's my all-time hero. Um, I don't care who I meet now. Um, I've, I've met him, I've shook his hand, I've chatted to him about his, uh, his, his records. You've never even heard of him, yet he's made a career out of recording. He's made a career out of touring. And yet he's sort of way down the scale in terms of you know, Bono, even Susan Vega. Then you have the, 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 the bands mainly who have a CV entry. You know, we, we were um, a band and we had um, two albums, three albums out from 2003 to 2006. Um, Comstat Angels, um, for me, uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, suddenly nobody's ever heard of, heard of them again. Reappear in Sheffield in 2009 and do a few one-off gigs. Then you have the guys who get the temp jobs. So think of the temp jobs you might have done as a student or, or, or you know, you, you, you're not sure whether you should put it on your um, CV, but actually it's, it's part of who you are. Um, really obscure band. Zero One from, from uh, Ireland, uh, toured with um, big bands, um, mid 80s, Paul Bell in the middle, still in the music industry, still, still doing stuff now, but actually the, 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 the temp job entry on their CV um, is, is no longer valid. So he's moved, moved on and done other things. And then you have the committed amateurs. So those guys in, in bedrooms um, with Max recording stuff and pushing stuff out there and doing pub gigs and what have you. And I, I, I class myself within, within that category. And if you think, think of the, the, the barriers um, to, to these guys, success opens up a whole wealth of opportunity in the Virgin Megastore and other places as well in terms of your records going in there. Once you get down to here, you know, dropped by the label, dropped by the label, label won't look at these guys, why would we look at these guys? Social changes all that, and I'll come on to that in a bit. Um, this is a part of a, um, something called a long tail, I'll explain the long tail um, more fully, but it's important as musicians we understand it because the the nature of um, the music industry has changed um, big time. And you might be, you, you, you certainly are aware of it, but you might not know the reasons why. So we take Virgin Megastore, for example. Um, popularity, so at the top you've got Madonna, and you've got U2, and you've got Wham, and you've got you know, whoever. And actually, you know, selling in there hundreds of thousands. And then all of a sudden you reach a point here, bang, Sorry, we haven't got any more shelf space for, for your, your record. Um, we, can't, we can't stock it. You drop by your label. So even, even with the biggest stores, you have that problem of how, how do we get rid of our stuff then? Do we sell it at gigs? Well, that's an option, but actually we can't get it out to the masses who are gonna be looking around the record stores. Um, my um, childhood, my teenage years, I am so thankful for Hippo Records in Cardiff. Hippo Records in Cardiff took a very different stance to the big guys and said, do you know what, we're going to buy up all the stock nobody else wants. We will get all the music that nobody's, nobody wants in the big record stores out there um, to the wider masses. And I discovered so many great artists um, through Hippo, Hippo Records and other independent um, stores. And then you used to have record fairs as well. So, you know, a record used to be around for a while and then it's gone. How do you get hold of it? You can't, sorry, it's not on the back catalogue anymore. You need to go to a specialist collector's fair. So the whole thing, hopefully you're thinking about, well, hang on a minute, this is awful. As, a, as, as an artist, how do I get my music out to an audience? You had big problems. The other side of that, long tail, it's not only the problem with the finite stock that you would have in a shop. Actually, think about the major record labels. Actually, there's a finite amount of money they've got, so there's a finite amount of artists they would have on their books at any one time and be dropping artists to bring new artists on who maybe would reach a wider audience would be more profitable. So a, a very, very strange model, a very difficult model for artists, very talented people um, to 
uh, push their music out uh, to the mass market in particular. Then something happened. Um, digital. And digital and the traditional business model clashed. And those of you with good eyesight can see all these pirates here, and we'll come on, come on to pirates in a minute. So, you're probably aware of this, but, you know, it, back in the day, to produce a single or an LP, it cost a lot of money to, you know, per unit for the cover art, for the pressing, uh, for the dis distribution to put in a van to get, get somewhere. Even for cassettes, you know, um, I've got in my mind that TD TDKC 90s is really sad and really geeky, costs about £1.15, even for a blank cassette. Um, I tend to buy lots of those. And then even for a CD, you know, there, there, is, a, there is physical media there Getting your, your um, latest album on there, getting your latest EP onto these things costs money. And all of a sudden, it changed. Digital, MP3s, and the like, changed the model. So now what we have, we still have all the stuff, the shop stocks in our long tail. All the important, you know, the, not the same important stuff, all the popular stuff, all the Rihannas and who, the whoever's at the top there that people are still buying in, the, in their thousands, the cold plays. But actually, this long tail goes on and on and on, probably all the way around the room. And there's enough space as emerging artists for all of us within that to um, release our stuff via digital, to hit audiences. Um, to, to, to be niche. And one of the words I, I, I thought I made up, I love, love to think I made up a word. We go, we go from, initially from broadcast to narrowcast. So we think, um, who initially is going to like my music? Um, where are they? How do I find them? And we'll come on to, to that within, within social and how that work works. Audience focused um, in particular. I'm hoping I've got something here actually to show you. Here we go. So, um, I've confessed to some people already that I almost became a, a manager of, of a band. The, the, the band were a band called Light Corporation. Um, they are from Poznan in Poland. They are very good friends of mine. And uh, what happened basically was um, got to know them really well, uh, brought them over to the UK. I went over to Poland, did a few music things over there for them. Um, got a phone call from uh, one of the guys out there and said... Uh, Oh, I hear you're their manager in the UK. I've got gigs lined up in Manchester and London um, for them. Um, can you sort out transport and can you sort out some accommodation and this, that and the other, the fluffy white towels? And it was like, no, I'm not, I'm not their manager. I'm not their manager. And one of the reasons why was um, any, anyone into avant-garde jazz here? Anybody? Avant-garde jazz, sort of soundtrack music? You're welcome for that. My, my gift to you. Um, Avant-garde jazz, you don't just book a hall and expect people to turn up. You need to know where your audience is. So these guys are in the long tail. Actually, they're not going to book a venue and expect people who like music to turn up. Why does everybody say, for example, like everybody says avant-garde avant avant jazz? Yeah. When you're talking about niche, you know, everybody says avant-garde jazz. That, that's, that's, yeah, so, so, so let me give you a, a very brief description of what that's like. Um, imagine lots of musicians doing soundscapes and stuff um, with uh, back projections. You might, you, having said that, you might like this, actually. Back projections of um, Soviet Poland and uh, Eastern Bloc countries, um, people marching and uh, poverty and all black and white and stuff. Very, very sort of descriptive, very, very um, powerful things, but very, very, I'd say niche. So when I did the gigs in the UK, um, there were two reactions. People would go, wow, do you know what? That is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Two, I, I don't know what, I, I don't know how to react. I have got no point of reference to, to react to that. So that's, 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 the reason I'd, I'd call it niche and, uh, you know, um, say actually this is, this is, this is where they, they are at this moment in time and doing really well in working out where their audiences are. 
The other side of a digital low is piracy. And uh, this, is, this is almost like a potted history of how it went. You know, home taping is kill, killing music. Uh, home taping is killing music. No home taping wasn't skilling, skilling music at all. It was putting a cassette in, pressing record, putting your vinyl on, and getting a really crappy version of what you're recording. It was rubbish. But having said that, when you get down to digital, it suddenly becomes a big issue because you have an exact copy of what's being produced. So there's a huge challenge here in terms of piracy, um, or how, how can you tackle a, a problem which is, which is global, which is international, or do you tackle it? Do you look for another, another way of tackling it? So let's move sideways into social um, media. I want to talk to you about social um, business models. It was, it was fascinating. Um, I really love this, this picture because it captures for me how a lot of people do social. Um, there was a great blog post um, for those of you who are on the is it a music think tank. Um, someone explaining this a couple of weeks ago and I still thought they've, they've captured it. It's almost like me sort of walking up and um, like my music. Go on, download, download it, download it, you love it, download it. Go on, download it, go on, like my music. Come to my gigs. Go on, go on, go for it, just go for it. Oh, I'm great, I'm brilliant. Hey, look how many, how many followers I've got, go for it. You, you know. And that's what social is like. It's, it's a lot of broadcasting, basically. It is, it is a pain in the butt. Um, I went on to, you, you're probably aware on Twitter, you get hashtag something something hour. I went on for a chat to people and people were trying to sell me um, wedding photography and everything in between. It was like, I've come on for a chat, that's just rude. I wouldn't, I wouldn't walk up to, well, I just did it to you, sorry, but, um, but, but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. How, how can I create a relationship? How can I create a friendship? How can I create the trust? I'm, I'm broadcasting. And this, this for me is exactly like that. You, you're talking to your friends and someone will walk in the door and start shouting. What we need to know, and I think you, you guys who were here probably a few months ago may, might have done some of this already, is the social model um, has meant the influence of communications has completely and utterly changed. And social media has been a huge factor in this. Um, apologies, this is, this is quite... Um, Blurred, but it won't be uh, when the slides come out on, on, uh, on the web. There used to be a time where the, the, the pyramid of influence in terms of what we buy and what we do and what we say was quite tight at the top there. And if you can read it, it says leaders, elders, experts. Right down the, the bottom was friends and family. I think, I think the music model for me um, probably doesn't reflect this. So actually from, from a, a very early age, I was interested into what my friends were listening to to find out new music. Uh, in particular. But leaders, elders, experts, I'd, I'd read the adverts, I would read um, what's being released, I would read the you know, NME record reviews and work out, is this worth buying? And sometimes we're completely let down by someone I thought, well actually they haven't let, listened to this properly, because this, this description here doesn't actually meet what's, what's being said, what's going on there. Um, the model has changed from one where we used to listen to the authority of people to more of a social model. So right at the top here, friends and family. Friends of friends and family. People like me is probably the most important there. So I know on, on social networks, the, the advice um, that I trust is people like me. Quick show of hands, anyone, anyone booked a holiday recently? Online? What was the first site you went to? Ryanair. Sorry? Ryanair. So you went straight to... Oh, wow, okay. Same. Same? Did you, did you just get, get a flight and go, go then? You didn't yeah, book I, accommodation? Yeah, sure. Not this. I knew I was, I knew I was going to. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and you still went for it? I went to Kayak. Yeah. Kayak. Where I found the websites. Okay. 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 So, so actually a comparison site. Yeah. So you, that's good. Any, any, anybody else for holiday? This could fall flat. This is, this is awful. TripAdvisor, anybody? Anyone use TripAdvisor? Yeah, a few show hands there. TripAdvisor um, is, 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 is uh, there's people like me behind me. 
So I remember going to chat to someone about Czech Republic um, earlier. I went, went to Czech Republic um, for, for a friend's um, birthday and um, I was doing a, a training session at the time and my wife booked it and I said, you checked TripAdvisor, didn't you? And there was a stony silence on the end of the phone. Um, I'll ring you back in five minutes. She rang me back in about an hour to say actually she, she'd unbooked where we were staying and rebooked somewhere else. And TripAdvisor had said that the place we'd, we'd booked, which from the leaders, the elders, the experts, looked fantastic. It was five star, it had a swimming pool, it had this, it had food and it had everything thrown in. Um, when you looked at TripAdvisor, uh, it was a bunch of lies. It was out of 600 places to stay um, in Prague, it was number 550th in terms of the rating and the ranking. And there were all sorts of uh, nasty business going on there. So what we'd, we'd chosen to do is actually believe complete and utter strangers um, about what a place was like. When I bought my latest guitar, I, I bought it on Amazon, which is a bit bizarre. I've never done that before. But I read down the reviews and I'm thinking, hang on a minute. I'm believing complete strangers here, how this guitar plays, how it feels, um, and what it's like. This is, this, is, this is really, really bizarre. What in any, any other walk of life would I do that, believe a complete stranger? I wouldn't. So social media has given us a, 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 a trust in people like me. The, the other side of things as well, um, not only the, 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 the change of influence, but actually this. This is a, a quote I took from um, someone responding to a blog uh, I, I put up about a year ago. And I just thought this was fantastic. Is it just me, or is the amount of different ways to promote online getting a little overwhelming? Anyone else feel like that? Totally, totally. I mean, who has the time to really build an audience on all these different outlets? If you're a musician, <laughs> or a producer, or a sound engineer, or a recording artist, or a, a talent agent. You know, that's, that's your main job. That's what you get paid for. Actually, who has the time to go onto all these different networks? You're probably looking at those and thinking, some of them I haven't heard of, so I haven't got a clue what they are. Some of you are thinking, where's this, and where's that, and where's that? And this is, this is part of the problem. There are so many choices out there, even, even in promoting music, um, it is becoming, uh, a huge sort of jungle of, of um, possibilities, but also of, of, of time-wasting possibilities as well. This is, this is one of the dangers. And the, the I suppose the best analogy is, is, is lost a bit because this is from the, from the late 70s, from my childhood. I know, I know you're going, oh, gosh, he was a child in the 70s. He looks so good for his age. He really does. I can't, I can't believe that. Well, I'm... Folks, folks, it's true. No, no Botox, but, but I was a child in the 70s. And there used to be um, a, a game show uh, for kids called Runaround. And everyone completely blanks, you know, because the, they don't admit, they, 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 if they know about it, they don't want to admit they knew about it. Mike Reed from EastEnders fame was, was the host. It was the first thing he, he did, big, big time-wise. And the premise of the the game show, you can probably see what, something's going on here. Um, grab a bunch of kids, give them some options. So, um, kids, what is the capital of France? Is it number one, Copenhagen? Is it number two, Rome? Or is it number three, Paris? And Mike would shout, run around now! And all the kids would go into the zone, you can probably make out the, the kids here, um, which one they thought it was. And what used to happen was um, this bizarre effect. So you'd have a kid standing in three going, I know it's Paris, but you know what, there's, there's five kids in, in Copenhagen. And Mike would say, run around now. So they had a second chance to make their mind up. And what would happen is someone who's, who's got exactly the right answer would go, three! And they go, oh no, I've got, I've got it completely wrong. And for me, that's what social media can be like. So you look at others and what they're doing, and you make decisions on, um, Adele has got, you know, 
X million number of followers on Twitter. Therefore, Twitter is for me and her style on Twitter is what I need to copy. Or um, someone's got you know, 200,000 uh, views on, on YouTube. Therefore, I need to do a funny YouTube um, clip of what I'm doing. And actually, we, we, we make a decision on where the people are rather than where we should be and where our audiences are in particular. And one of the big questions we need to ask is what does social media success um, look like to us? That's a really, really biggie. And to unearth that, you've got to go a bit deeper. And I'd ask you, and I've, I've asked uh, Nick this already, put him on the spot when I spoke to him earlier, what does success in music look like to you? I'm just going to leave, leave a pregnant pause there for you to think about that. What does success in music look like to you? Um, in my formative years, I was really challenged. I wish this was my own quote, but it was um, a late night discussion on TV. And um, it, I suppose it really shaped me and, and what I've gone on to do and what I haven't gone on to do. And um, the, the, the comment was, um, if, you think, if, think, if you think music is all about making money, and being rich and famous, uh, you've missed the point. And the analogy was, it's a bit like going to a restaurant for an amazing food and, and just tasting the food and a you know, real sort of mixture of flavours and, and you know, just enjoying the food. But before you get there, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to be eating tonight, I wonder what the toilets are like there. And the point was, I thought, was, was superb, that actually success and making lots and lots of money are actually a byproduct um, of, of what you do in music. They're, they're not a given by any, any, any means. And once you sort of you know, get that um, sort of fixed within you, you think, do you know what? I'm actually going to enjoy myself. I'm going to have a bit of fun with what I'm doing. Actually, if, if success happens, it happens. And there's lots of reasons why success could happen. There's lots of reasons why, why success might not happen as well. But if it happens, do you know what? I'm going to enjoy, enjoy the ride rather than think of what's, what's down there. And I, I think, I think um, success is inevitable if you define what you want. Yeah. But almost like if success happens, that's like almost like the 60s attitude. Like it's wishing on a star. I yeah. Think it's, I think if you put steps in place to make success happen, it can yeah. happen. Yeah. It might not happen when you want it to. Yeah. If you're taking progressive steps towards a goal, yeah. then... It's like defining what you think success is. Yeah, totally, totally. For, for, for me, and I'm going to be really sad here, was, was playing at a festival um, not a million miles away in my, in my house, singing a song that I've written. Two people I didn't know walked into the, the, the crowd. That sounded, it wasn't, wasn't huge by any means. Two people walked in, in, in and started singing the song. And I thought they, they, they found that somewhere. That's fantastic. That was, that, was, that was the level of my success where I was at. And I thought, that's, yeah, fantastic. That really got me fired up. But actually, it might be incremental steps to where you want to get to, um, in particular. So let's throw in social media um, to, to this and see what happens. And um, I suppose two examples, uh, one, one which you probably know very well, one which you may not know. Um, these guys spring to mind. Top one. Do you recognize top one at all? Rage Against the Machine. So, in terms of social media, um, can anyone tell me what their strategy was with social media? No. Uh, X, X factors involved, but actually they had no strategy. A, a, a bunch of people who didn't like the X factor got together on Facebook and said, um, let's, let's really make a stand about this. How can we make a stand? Um, what song... Uh, is out there that we could push to Christmas number one and really push it. And this was the one. So, so they had social media success and really had no part in it. So it goes back to the, the point of sometimes success is, is forced upon you um, and it happens. Some, sometimes you have to work at it. What was interesting was reading some quotes after this happened. Like what I wanted them to do was like, um, because the whole Rage Against the Machine thing is very, very, um, we use the word again, sorry, Tommy, very niche. 
they have a great, great following, a passionate following, and I almost want them to say, well, hey, we're Christmas number one, well, that sucks. We, we, don't, we don't believe in the charts. I want them to say that, and they didn't. They went, yeah, we're Christmas number one. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> have, have, have they even sold out? <laughs> so success through, through social media um, sometimes can be just forced upon you. Um, anyone recognize these guys down the bottom? This is really left field, sorry. These guys and girl um, are called the Gregory Brothers. Anyone heard of the Gregory Brothers? Yeah. Um, Gregory Brothers uh, gigging, recording, and then suddenly they found out um, what they, they could do was they could actually auto-tune the news, which you might have heard of. So taking news clips, auto-tuning them, putting some music, and it sounds, sounds a bit naff, but these guys are, are superb musicians. So it sounds superb, whatever they produce. Um, Anton Dodson, ring any bells with anybody? Anton Dodson, yeah, we've got smiles, yeah, was, was, was somebody they auto-tuned. This guy, um, I think his family had just been attacked. He went on camera and very poetically told the attackers how he was coming for them. And they auto-tuned him. Um, it was the biggest uh, viewed YouTube video, I think, in 2010 or 2011. So, so success for them has been getting, getting out, moving sideways into something else. Um, the effect is actually, as the Gregory Brothers, the act, it's, it's, it's giving them success as, as artists in their own right. The battle is, of course, um, everyone knows them, Frent and Dodson auto-tune the news, and they're going to be funny, and yeah, they might be, but, but actually being, being artists in their own right is now, now a bit of an issue for them as well. Um, it wouldn't be um, a talk on social media if I didn't use social media. Uh, and I was thinking of, of people I know that have, I, I think have had social media success using some of the, the ready you know, made tools are out there, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and the like. And it'd be good to share. Um, I, know, I know for, for a fact, looking around the room, I, I, I said earlier, I've been checking you guys out. I know for a, for a fact that some of you had, have had some success with social media already. You know, that's fantastic. Um, I want to share um, with you some of these guys, though. This is a guy called um, Sean Carter. Um, he's based in Austin, uh, USA. He's, he's a guitarist, acoustic guitarist, um, singer-songwriter. Um, he followed me uh, on Twitter and um, thought nothing of it. He didn't do the promote broadcast, like my music, buy my music, um, just followed me. And just the act of someone who's a musician following me usually gets my attention and I go and check out their music and tweet it back and said, wow, I really love your music, it's fantastic, um, really appeals to me. And over a period of time we got into conversations about um, the production of his album and all sorts, which really benefited me. I'm actually connecting with someone who was, who was on a journey that was way ahead of me, really helped me. The, the, the thing that wasn't very helpful was when I said, Sean, I said, you, you've got some um, superb um, sounds happening there, you know, how, how do you build the guys around you? And he said, well, most of my friends are um, session musicians for the top acts in the US. And it was like, yeah, I, I can't copy that, Sean, that's not very helpful at all, but thank you for, for letting me know what's, what standard we're talking to here. Um, Sean had um, three things he, he said, and this, this, this is hot for the press, it came through at 12 o'clock last night when I reminded him and said, Sean, I'm doing this talk, um, I wanted to once you get your views. Um, these are the three I thought were superb. From my iPhone and MacBook, I've created a worldwide uh, fan base. And that's one of the, the, the key things about social media. Your, your fan base is no longer limited to the, the, the people down the, the venue that you play or the town you're playing in or the, the, the demographic. Actually, it can be anyone and everybody. And social media can help you discover those people and it can also help you engage with those people as well. Um, I really like this one. Um, I've also discovered many similar artists and partnered with them on projects, shows, and cross-pollinating audiences. So actually for him, he's grown his own audience by working with other people, which I thought was, was just amazing. Sometimes as musicians, it's like, oh, no, this is, this, is, this is mine, this is mine. This is, this is my creative space, go away, go away. No, you're not having it, you're not having it. And by opening his arms and saying, hey, who, who else is out there? Um, who wants to be part of this? Actually, it's, it's helped him. One of the, the results or the, the um, successes for him 
many of my favourite co-written songs are a result of the relationships I've made via Twitter.